Okay, thank you all for having me here this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to this event. I'm particularly looking forward uh, with excitement to talking to you about the excitement of finding some new things that have been plaguing me for many, many years in the study of mechanisms of organic reactions. Uh, in studying mechanisms, we're trying to figure out what's happening at a tiny microscopic level without being able to see the molecules and see what's really happening. And so all of our evidence is indirect in terms of what an organic chemistry mechanism is like or any mechanism in chemistry. Uh, I'm going to show you by the end of tonight, I hope, that today technology in terms of computer technology and theoretic te theoretical technology has reached a level where we are at a kind of a nirvana state uh, with being able to see now how reactions occur and we're going to be able to play movies that show them in action uh, and we'll see the pluses and, and minuses of that. Before we start, I know this is a fairly general audience and so I'd like to start by showing you how I'm going to depict chemistry structures. The structures on the left are probably fairly readable to you uh, if I give you a couple hints that these atoms, these gray atoms are carbons, the little ones are hydrogens, the red ones are oxygens. The structures on the right are the same as what's on the left, but they're called framework structures in which we remove the hydrogens and just write them as a frame so that this CH3 group just appears as a line with a carbon at the end of that line. So every point here is a carbon atom, and at the end of every point is a carbon atom. Okay, uh, next I'm going to show you how chemists generally envision energy in chemical reactions. Energy is everything in chemistry. It's the beginning and end almost of chemistry in terms of how to understand what's going on. This is a very simple fundamental reaction. A hydrogen atom comes up, pulls a hydrogen atom off of HBr, makes a new hydrogen-hydrogen bond, the Br leaves. The geometry of the atoms is shown down here as you shrink the HH distance and lengthen the HBr distance. The energy changes is shown, starting in what we'll see later is a valley going up to what we call a transition state, which it turns out is a mountain pass, and then coming down into another valley. For that exact reaction, I have, instead of, whoops, I hit that clicker by accident, I have this energy surface, which shows how that reaction occurs in 3D. So we start here at a high valley, go uphill. These are like uh, contour lines. We go uphill to a mountain pass and then go down into a deeper valley at lower energy. This shows a similar energy diagram for a more complicated reaction. We start at a valley. We end up going up to a transition state, down to another valley for an intermediate that's short-lived, then we go over two transition states to two products. This is a particularly interesting situation when you've got more than one product possible. You want to be able in chemistry to predict which product are you going to get. Uh, we can predict that one way using what I call the evans polanyi principle in which the more stable product oftentimes has the lower energy transition state. That's a way you can quanti qualitatively predict what's going to happen. If you can calculate, which we can these days, the energies of these transition states, then we can figure out the product ratio, the ratio of the rate for A, let's call this A, and the ratio of the rate for B there, so that the ratio of the two products will be given by this very simple equation, knowing this delta G delta delta G dagger, which is the difference in energy between the two transition states. This has stood uh, the test of time for 70 or 80 years, and it's called transition state theory in chemistry, and it's well-founded. We're going to see later, though, that there's problems with transition state theory. Uh, we'll 
come to that as we get there. Let's move on. Here are the computational methods that I'm taking advantage of. Uh, first and foremost, we're doing quantum calculations using a Gaussian 2009 program. Uh, Popol wrote the program, he and his students over a period of many years. Walter Cohn contributed the very important density functional theory and the two won the Nobel Prize in 1998. And most of you probably know that Walter Cohn is on our faculty in the physics department here. Uh, we approximately solve the Schrodinger equation, try to find the energy. We search for the geometries and energies of the valleys, and we try to find the geometries and energies of the transition states. And then later I'm going to show you how we get to nirvana using molecular dynamics trajectories in which we use quantum mechanical calculations to compute the forces on the atoms, Newton's laws of motion to compute how the atoms move as they go through a chemical reaction so that we can see a realistic movie of what actually happens in the chemical reaction. Here's the first time when we ran into a problem with transition state theory. We didn't know how to explain a whole bunch of experimental results related to this reaction. Now this is a pretty complicated reaction. Uh, I'm not going to try to walk you through the whole thing, but let's just focus on the fact that we get, whoops, hit that. Hard to have two hands and know which one to push. Okay, uh, so up here we have a, a, a product here. There's the starting material. It has a double bond, a carbon-carbon double bond. We're going to transfer an oxygen from this per acid to the double bond. That oxygen is there. We're going to make a four-membered ring the same as was there. But the odd thing is, is we get this product with the three-membered ring, and both products form simultaneously in the reaction, and we couldn't think of any reasonable mechanism by which that could happen. No reasonable high mountain valley intermediates that could serve as a branching point to go to one and the other, and uh, we were forced in Ken Hill's thesis to suggest one possibility, that there could be branching at or before or after the transition state, of this reaction in which these two products would be formed without any intermediate from a branching point. I'll explain to you in a moment the significance of that. And uh, we said this is an interesting possibility but not readily testable. Today I can show you how we can test that kind of idea. Here shows a picture of what we're talking about in that paragraph above. Here's the transition state coming uphill from the starting material. Here's the transition state. At the transition state, you could branch to two different products. Remember before when I had two products possible, there were two transition states that you went through and you could compare the energies of the transition states and predict the product ratio. Here you have a single transition state and then you branch. How in the devil are you ever going to figure out how much of each you're going to get? when you don't have two transition state energies that you can compare. We'll see that. That's where trajectories are going to come in. This shows a three-dimensional energy surface, much like this diagram that we're talking about, where you go through a transition state, but at the transition state, there's two valleys that you can go into. Coming up from the starting material on the other side of this diagram, you reach the transition state, and then you can branch. You can go this pink route to get to one product, or you could branch and go this way to get to the other valley. That's a picture of what's going on. I'd like you to get the idea that this is just like walking across mountains over mountain passes like you're out backpacking. It's not significantly different. Uh, when you get to one of these points where you have to choose which road to go on, Yogi Berra said, when you get to a fork, just take it. Okay. Uh, but we want to know which one you're preferably going to take. Yogi didn't address that point exactly. Uh, this shows an interesting relationship of these diagrams we're going to be talking about and the Earth's surface. This idea of being at a mountain pass and going to two different valleys, that could conceivably happen on the Earth's surface. If rain fell on a mountain pass, it could go to two valleys that would require a mountain stream to bifurcate 
to split into two and go down two valleys. That almost never happens on Earth, but there's one spot in Venezuela, doggone it, hit the wrong button again. There's one spot in Venezuela where that happens on the Rio Orinoco. There's a mountain pass up there. As you come down, this river splits, and part of the Rio Orinoco splits off. It goes into the Rio Negro, the Amazon out the Atlantic. The other part goes into the Caribbean. Uh, rare event on Earth. Happens usually in a flat region. It also usually happens in a flat region in chemistry surfaces, it turns out. Now, we need to be able to get at this issue of how to make predictions about what's going to happen. And Yogi had something to say about that, too. And uh, here is the first time uh, that this reaction that we're going to study next is going to be discussed. This is a reaction that Rapol and Coney in France studied in which you start with one of these three-membered ring oxygen compounds and you get two different products, one with a three-membered ring carbon ring, the other with a four-membered ring carbon ring. That may sound familiar. Okay? Going through a mechanism like this, presumably he wrote it as going through that intermediate. When we did very good quantum calculations on that reaction, we found that that supposed intermediate actually occurred as a transition state, not as a valley. And the two transition states that are shown here are virtually identical, so they're essentially the same transition state and the same energy. And they branch and go to the two different products, and we were able to confirm that by the energies and so forth, but it wasn't 100% positive in 1998. Some years later, we started to do bifurcation uh, calculations using trajectories, and here gives you an example of one of those calculations. There's the starting three-membered ring oxygen compound. It's going uphill to the transition state. You see this is kind of tricky. It's breaking the bond and putting it back together. It's got enough energy to get to the top, but it doesn't just go there directly. In fact, it starts to break the other bond, not what you would have expected just from reading an organic chemistry book. Here it finally gets to that intermediate, okay, which is not an intermediate but a transition state. Here it is on the way downhill from the transition state, and it's going to form a three-membered ring carbon ring. There it is. Breaks it, forms it again in a moment, and then finally keeps it in that structure. The reason why the molecules are distorting so much moving around and zigzagging through different structures is because these molecules, when they're first formed, have all the energy that was present at that transition state. So they have a lot of excess energy in them to just move around and do all kinds of things. So that's what the movie really looks like. That's what a reaction really looks like. Here we're going to go to the four-membered ring product. The four-membered ring product's there. You saw the hydrogen move over, and that's the four-membered ring product. What's cool about this now is that when we choose between the three-membered ring product here and the four-membered ring product there, the transitions, the supposed transition state energies were at the same energy, would have predicted a 50-50 product ratio. The actual product ratio is 95-5 or, or more in favor of the three-membered ring. When we, that's inconsistent with the transition state energies but it is consistent with these trajectories that we compute in which we do get something very close to a 95-5 ratio of those two products. How do we get that ratio? By, doing, by biting the bullet and doing hundreds and hundreds of trajectories and then averaging to see how many times does it go to one product, how many times does it go to the other. A sort of seat of the pants method. Another odd thing here is that there's a bunch of other products formed in these trajectories, so that instead of just a bifurcation, this is in effect a much more complicated situation in which it's a pentafurcation. There's at least five different products formed. We've got other cases where many more products are formed. Here goes back to that original reaction that we talked about where we first hypothesized the idea of bifurcation at a time when it really wasn't uh, studied in chemistry really hadn't been hypothesized in, in organic chemistry at all before that time. Uh, and 
we have gone on and now done the trajectories for this reaction at the bottom. And there's some similar reactions that show similar results. Here goes the picture. Here goes the movie. The oxygen that's going to transfer is this baby. He's going to go down there and land on that carbon-carbon double bond. He does so by a mechanism which is pretty close to the one that people think is happening in chemistry. There's the final product with the three-membered ring product. What about with the three-membered ring epoxide and the four-membered ring product? What about the one with the three-membered carbon ring? Here's the same transition state, or the same starting material. I'm going to go through a transition state. I'll tell you when we get to the transition state. It's right about there. And then that oxygen transfers in a fashion that's very similar to what it did before. But now this carbon-carbon bond is going to break. Instead of a bond forming between oxygen and carbon here, that bond is going to break and make the three-membered carbon ring that we saw there. This just replays that movie. We'll skip that. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the other kinds of situations where this can happen, since we first studied these things, we now have looked at other epoxidations, other oxygen transfer reactions. Here's a whole series of cyclopropenes with three-membered ring double bonds that give two products and where we can pretty closely calculate the experimental uh, ratios of products. It's not perfect, uh, but we can do pretty well. Here's a recent example uh, that I did with my colleague uh, Li Ming Zhang in which we found that this starting material here containing two gold atoms and some acetylene groups those materials form rings. They form a new six-membered ring here or a new five-membered ring there. Initially, we only knew that the product was the five-membered ring in this particular example. The energy surface we calculated looks like this. You go through a transition state, you come down one of those ridges, and then you can fall into this valley to give the six-membered ring, or you can fall into that valley to give the five-membered ring. The deeper valley was the six-membered ring, but it fell in the shallower valley. That seems a little counterintuitive, but that's what happened in this particular case. What's really cool, though, is that we've changed the things that are hooked onto this ring and hooked onto this molecule. And when we change the energy in this diagram and drag this energy yet lower or raise that energy a bit higher, we see that the product ratios that we get out of trajectories, I'll show you the trajectories in a moment, but the product ratios we get from the trajectories shift from favoring this initially to favoring the more stable one as we make the more stable one more and more stable. That is an extension of what's called the Evans-Polanyi principle in transition state theory uh, that I mentioned briefly before. Let's take a look at the movie here. There's the movie, the starting material. We break the ring to the gold. This is a phosphorus up here. That's a gold there. We make the five-membered ring. Here's the same movie over again, in case you missed it the first time. Here's the five-membered ring forming. Look at it wiggle around, but it stays there. Okay, here's the next one. This is another trajectory with another initial set of the velocities of the atoms that is different, and now we end up with the six-membered ring. So we get both, and we can calculate how many times we expect both. Let me talk a little bit about what is really new and really interesting, I think, then, about what I've shown you. Uh, instead of the traditional surfaces, we have non-traditional surfaces that we've found for a wide variety of reactions in a wide variety of chemistry. I haven't shown you, by any means, all the ones that we've discovered. And those are called bifurcations, and we've seen that they can also involve trifurcations. Yeah, I haven't shown you a trifurcation, but I've shown you a pentafurcation. We've seen them up to 10, uh, 10 or more products forming from the same trajectory uh, system in which you have no intermediate, you fly through this transition state and can come out a bunch of different ways. Uh, the Cases where you have multiple products formed, that's a totally new idea in this field that other people had not seen before we saw this. And 
it involves a really complicated energy surface. And what's interesting here is, is I don't think you really need to know all the details of exactly where the, all the transition states and little bumps and ripples on the surface are. You can get to lots of different products, and you still need trajectory theory to predict what the product ratios are going to be. I think transition state theory is going to be useless in those situations, or near useless. Product ratios on bifurcating surfaces are subject to dynamic factors. Uh, when you're on a surface like this, you can think about this a lot like rolling marbles down this surface. That when you are moving on this surface, you start here and you come up the edge and then you go back down to the bottom and you zigzag up here, you come along there, you hit here and come out that way. Okay? If you have a bifurcating surface and you have to choose, are you going to go one way or the other? I'm going to come down off this stage and I'm going to choose whether to go up that aisle or go down this aisle. I come down here. I bounce against this wall. Bounce against this wall. These are vibrations. These are all those vibrations you saw in the molecule. I bounce against this wall. I hit this baby here and boom, hit that one hard and I go down this path. It's your momentum. The momentum of the particles carries you this way. Can you imagine trying to teach organic chemistry or any kind of chemistry and be able to portray to students how are you going to select which way if it depends on how you bounced off the walls? Craziness, man. Uh. <laughs> Here I come down again. This time I started in a different place with different velocities. I hit this wall here. Now I hit this wall and bounce off and go out this valley. So which valley I go down depends a great deal on, depends a lot on where you started and what velocities your atoms had at the beginning. And finally, uh, we see that even though some reaction paths will prefer the more stable product uh, in transition state theory, we wouldn't, with these dynamical factors, expect necessarily that the more stable product would be formed or would be predictable to be preferred if you're bouncing off all these walls. That doesn't have any direct relationship to which product is more stable, which valley is more deep. In the evans polanyi principle and transition state theory, when you have two different transition states, there are some really sound arguments that can lead you to predict that one transition state will be lower than the other based on the depth of the product valley that you're going to go into, but not any direct connection logically in trajectory theory or in this bifurcation mechanism. Nevertheless, we found examples that I told you in the gold case, and I've been looking at a number of others where we can confirm that many times, we don't know how general it'll be, but this is another whole new area of this field in which we can salvage the evans polanyi principle, it looks like, to predict which way we're going to go down these dynamical trajectories and where we're going to end up. That'll be very valuable in uh, teaching chemistry, perhaps, and in helping to understand the chemistry in more detail. So I'm really pleased that that seems to be working out that way, but we still have to see a lot about the texture of that landscape in terms of how it's going to finally end up uh, and how many reactions we're going to be able to use that. But I'd sure love to salvage the evans polanyi principle because it's one of the few things that, together with some perturbation theory arguments are about the only two ways you can predict which product is going to be preferred in a chemical reaction. So it's a very tough problem, and it would be great if, uh, if it was amenable to solution in this way. And I think that will end my talk. If I've got any time left over, I'd be happy to take questions if they'll let me. And if they won't, I'll say thank you very much for your time this afternoon, and I really enjoyed sharing with you my enthusiasm for getting to some answers after waiting, in some cases, 40 years or more to try to figure out what happened